This is lecture 19. This is essentially a repeat of the last lecture, but uh, included in this is an introduction to experiment 7. So once again, I'll quit, quit trying to say that because uh, I'm going to say that a lot. A lot of this is repeat. This is your, your RISC-V microcontroller. Pretty much every signal on there is associated with I.O. except for essentially a reset clock. Every other signal is associated with I.O. So I.O. massively important. And so there's different ways to do I.O. Uh, what we've been doing up to this point is using, well essentially it's programmed I.O. Uh, which was memory mapped I.O. So we've been using input and output under generally speaking uh, program control. But what we want now is to switch over to interrupt driven I.O., which is essentially I.O. driven by, we'll say, an external device, a, a device external to the microcontroller. Now the issue here is it's interrupt driven. This is the interrupt input. It's a single input to the RISC 5 controller. So once again, bed, okay, once again, uh, what a computer does essentially is just waiting waiting for you to uh, interact with it and so it's waiting for input and so generally speaking when you're designing you know such a system that's waiting for input that you want it to be responsive once it does it once it does you know react to what you do you want it to react very soon if you see a delay you're not going to like that uh, you want to actually have the appropriate amount of hardware for the task at hand so if you're just blinking led you probably don't want you know top-end microcontroller and so that's essentially you don't want more memory than you need etc etc and uh, so most important thing here not most important but another item here is generally a system you want to keep the throughput high so essentially what this means is there are things your microcontroller con can do that are intelligent things and there's some kind of stupid things the stupid things are just not really doing anything it's just that not having anything to show for what it does okay so the idea here is if you have something important to do you want to be doing that you don't want to be stuck doing something stupid yeah so the, uh, the issue here in the big scheme of things you want to keep your processor busy but not too busy if it's um, not busy ever that probably means you can maybe use a smaller uh, microcontroller. If it's too busy, that means you might take a hit in response time. So it's it's kind of a, a fine line there. So the issue here is you've got stuff to do, and there's two ways to do it. You can do it with, I'll say internally with the microcontroller, or you can uh, have some other piece of hardware on the outside that is doing something for you, so uh, such that the microcontroller doesn't have to do it. Now the issue here, what we're getting at, is this external thing is going to talk to the micro, it's going to communicate with the microcontroller somehow. Generally speaking, it's it's going to be with the interrupt signal. So it's not, it's sort of program control, but it's initiated externally. So this is a classic uh, polling loop here. So essentially, uh, there's a couple ways to act on something here. And what I'm, what I'm thinking in this is that this piece of code here is waiting for some button and so this is essentially a loop right here and what it's doing is constantly uh, stuck in this loop checking to see if someone pressed a button now the only way it's going to break out of this loop is if someone presses a button now this is this is a classic polling loop that means it's if it's stuck in this loop it's doing stupid stuff uh, it's not really doing anything effective it is waiting for you to press a button but you know that's that's okay so long as you don't have something important to do. The problem is when it's stuck in this loop it can't go out and do other things and this is uh, the problem with a polling loop. So the way around that is to make it interrupt driven and instead of the the uh, program asking the external device, hey do you got something for me? Uh, what it, an interrupt is going to do is allow the external device to tell the microcontroller, hey I got something for you and once again it's done the interrupt interrupts generally speaking use them for two reasons it increases your system throughput by essentially avoiding polling and it's going to re it's going to reduce your response time so n interrupts nothing big here it's, it's essentially a subroutine that is initiated 
by hardware. Okay, so once again, your your microcontroller is doing its normal processing. It gets an interrupt. What if that normal processing is interrupted and it goes and does some other processing, which essentially means that other processing for the interrupt is run at a higher priority than the 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 normal processing. So another fact there, interrupts interrupt code generally runs at higher priority than the normal code. So these are the this is the outline of a call and return. So when I execute a call, remember I'm executing call instruction, call instruction, it does save the return address, and that's the address of the instruction after the call, saves that in X1. And then it loads the PC with the address of the subroutine. And when, when you're done, what I'm going to do is execute a return from a subroutine. What it's going to do is it's going to take RA and load it into the program counter. Now, interrupt is very much the, the same. Uh, the, it receives an interrupt. Once again, this isn't under program control. This is under like an external device is asserting the interrupt pin. So what it's going to do is it needs to save that return address. That return address is essentially the address of the instruction after the instruction that was executing when it got the interrupt. So I have a special place I store it, which is a CSR register. One of the CSR registers, there's actually three of them. I'm just going to store that address of that instruction in there. I'm going to execute the subroutine, and I am going to uh, execute a M return. Which is a machine return. So what that is going to do is take that address I stored, very much like R1 up here, take that that address, which is the return address, and put that into the PC. And that's how I'm going to return from subroutines. So this the CSR control and status registers. This it's a block that is in the microcontroller. It essentially has three registers in it. Uh, two of them are address registers, so they're 32-bit. This is a single bit register, which is essentially a interrupt enable. So you can look at these. You can see this is the this is the vector vector interrupts. This is a, a PC, and this is an interrupt enable to work with those acronyms a little bit. So this is a standard example here of what I'm doing is. Taking uh, every time I get an interrupt, I'm going to toggle LED. So we're going to step through this program you saw before. Uh, we can step through it again because it's just so damn interesting. Uh, so so what's going to happen here is uh, I I'm going to get an interrupt. Okay, so when I when I get an interrupt, the first thing it does is it it completes execution of the instruction that it's currently executing. And the problem is, the issue is, is that interrupts are, are coming from an external device. They're not synchronized with the microcontroller controller clock. So that means uh, you can come in, you can get an interrupt in the middle of instruction. I'm going to complete that instruction. Uh, then I'm going to act on that interrupt. I'm going the interrupt cycle, which is a state in the state machine. I'm going, I'm going to disable further interrupts. I am going to store the address of the instruction af after the instruction that I was executing when I got the interrupt. I'm going to store that in the CSR register. And then I am going to take that, that vector, which I previously wrote in the CSR register. This is the address of the interrupt service routine. I'm going to put that into the PC. So I'm going to do that in one state. I can do that in one state. We'll see that in a second. And so when I'm done, all I need to do is issue a m return and the idea of the m return is it takes the, the return address which i loaded into this register uh, puts it in the pc okay <laughs> it's not the rat <laughs> it's the risk five okay yes uh, so this is this is the um the new object you're going to put in there you can see these two 32-bit addresses here are connected to uh, the PC. And the other issue here is the this interrupt able bit uh, connects to this AND gate. So this is this has the ability to enable or disable that AND gate, depending whether the, the interrupt enable is a one or a zero. So when this line is a zero, 
that is always a zero. When this is a one, uh, this this signal here uh, is this signal. So to, to pass this interrupt signal to the state machine, I need this uh, this this register, which is a flip flop. It needs to be a one. Interrupt cycle is what I need to do to act on an interrupt. So we went over that. I need to do three different things here, but this is when I do it. So essentially, interrupt can come in any time. Uh, but what I'm going to do here is the end of this execute cycle. If I have an interrupt and it's not a load type instruction, I'm going to go into interrupt cycle. Okay, if it is a load type instruction, I'm always going to the right back. Okay, in the right back, if I don't have an interrupt, it's just normal processing. If I do have an interrupt, it goes into the interrupt cycle once again. So it's always going to finish the instruction it's on based on the state machine. And and if it's it's it is going to always uh, even if it's a load instruction, it's going to finish that instruction too. So the the notion is is masking these interrupts. So in in order to be in order for the microcontroller to act on an interrupt, the interrupts have to be unmasked or enabled. So essentially, if you mask the interrupts and you get an interrupt, the microcontroller ignores that interrupt. So the idea is I have to set this one bit here, either a one or a zero. So if it's a one, it, allow, it allows the external interrupt signal to pass through that AND gate to the actual microcontroller. Uh, that AND gate, if it has a zero here, the interrupts are disabled, meaning they're masked, meaning that interrupt signal will never make it through to the microcontroller. Interrupt driven programs, they have a couple different parts, um, standard parts, you get used to it here. Uh, essentially there's some init code, typically subroutines and programs have init code. There's some special init code for interrupt driven programs. The next is the main code or uh, the background task or some people call it the main task. That's, that's what the code is doing kind of when it doesn't have an interrupt. So when it gets an interrupt, then the microcontroller acts on it. It goes to the interrupt code. So this is this is going to be the foreground task. Okay, the interrupt service routine is the foreground task. The main code is the background task. So we have what we have here is two new instructions. Now, so one of the instructions is the return. And essentially, the return instruction just takes that that return address that was previously written it was written as part of the interrupt cycle i wrote it to the pc i'm sorry i wrote it to the csr register me pc and now what i'm going to do is retrieve it from that register and put it into the program counter so this right here is the address of the instruction that was ex the address of the instruction after the instruction that was executing when i got an interrupt so uh this 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 instruction here is allows me to write to those three registers in the the csr object so there's three registers there there's mie i should have written them down here mie which is interrupt interrupt enable m e p c m t vec okay so anytime i want to write to one of these registers here i use I use this command. Now the issue here is you can, in the uh, RARS assembler, you can call these out without using address. So these actually have a, this is actually a label with an address associated with it. You don't need to know that address. It's actually in the CSR module code, not a big deal. Okay, so when I, what this instruction does is it takes, it, it takes this, this value right here and it puts it in into the register okay and the register it puts it in is 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 called out by this value right here so once again it takes this is your source register it takes that from it takes that from a register and writes it in the csr register and so uh, so essentially that's going to allow me to write values right to these three registers as part of the csr 
Okay, so let's look at that and we can see that. And this is our big solution here. Remember, this thing is blinking an LED. So this is our this is the initialization code up here. Uh, I'm first I'm just gonna put that address in a register, not a big deal, but here's our first interrupt initialization code. What I'm doing is using this the load address instruction to take the address of the ISR and put it in X6. Here's the ISR down here, it's a label. The LA load address instruction is going to take that address, put it in X6. I store that address X6 in, in MTVEC, which is part of the CSR register. Now this is the address of the ISR, so when I get an interrupt, what I'm going to do is take that address and stick it into the PC. Other things I want to do here, I like using flags here. This is X8 is a flag variable, so it's like a Boolean. Uh, when this X8's zero, the flag's off. When it's non-zero, the flag's on. This thing is blinking LED, so I'm keeping track of the LED by initializing it to zero. And then I go ahead and write it with this instruction here, so the LED starts in the off position. So that means uh, that's another part of initialization. And the last part of the initialization that has to do with interrupts is the notion of I have to enable the interrupts. Now I believe that fires up disabled. I need to enable them. So I'm sticking a 1 into X10. I'm writing X10 to MIE. So MIE is a one of the registers in the CSR block, and it's actually only one one bit long so it's actually a flip-flop okay so i'm ready to go here and this is essentially this is the you know main loop here uh, it's waiting for x it's waiting for x8 so long as okay so long as x8 is equal to zero it jumps to loop okay so as long as x8 is equal to zero it just it stays here the only way x8 can change is by getting an interrupt. Now this problem assumes that some external devices generate an interrupt. And so some external device generates that interrupt. What I do is I load X8 with a one. Um, that means, it, and then I return, that means it's gonna return to this instruction. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna break out of this loop and drop down into here. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to toggle the least significant bit of my X20, which is my LED storage register, and then then I'm going to output it. So this is this is part of the you know just the general program here, but this here is part of maybe my administration task. So what I'm going to do is that flag got set in the interrupt service routine. I'm going to go ahead and clear it, but more importantly. I am going to re-enable the interrupt. So if you look at X10, X10, X10 still has a one in it. I haven't changed it. So it's gonna write a one to MIE, and then I'm gonna jump back up to here. And once I jump back up there, I'm ready for another interrupt. So what this is gonna do is every interrupt, it's going to toggle the LSB, and it looks like the LED is blinking. So once again, this problem assumes that some external device is generating the interrupt. So experiment seven, it builds on experiment six. Essentially, we're uh, adding the interrupt capability to the risk five. Now, this is last hardware modification you need to do with this experiment for the, I mean, for risk five, and we're done. Essentially, the approach is you need to understand the interrupt architecture. So I'd read over the text in the experiment. Uh, you need to make the required changes to the hardware. Um, that's detailed in, uh, it's actually detailed in the experiment and the text and then you're going to test that uh, test that using provided uh, program so I'm going to provide the program and uh, you're just going to run it and verify that it works but uh, you, to do this you got to understand the program so this is the program and this was actually written from using a uh, GCC, so it has some has some weird stuff up there that you don't need to worry about. But the program itself, uh, it doesn't it doesn't really do a whole lot. Um, what I'm what I'm trying to do is essentially I'm just blinking LED again, 
It's saying, it's saying essentially the blinking LED code. I did throw an extra no op in here, but um, you're going to step this program through the simulator and verify everything works on it. Now the things you want to verify in the the simulator are are this. You want to verify that that you wrote to the CSR register, and then once again you want to verify you wrote again to the CSR register, and then uh, wait. Since we're going to wait a while, so wait a while. You got to wait a while to do this stuff, and after a while, you're going to turn on the interrupt. Okay, the interrupt. You're going to connect with a button. You're going to turn the interrupt on. It's going to generate an interrupt. You're going to see it go down to this code. And you can look at the program counter and watch that. Make sure it does it. And then it's going to return to one of these instructions up here. After it returns to one of those instructions, it's going to break out of this loop, drop down to these instructions. And once again, you want to see this work. And then uh, this instruction work too. It's just going to jump back up here. So you got a couple things going on. You want to verify that you're correctly writing to the CSR reg registers. And, and most importantly, when you get an interrupt, it's going to, you don't see it in here, but it's going to write the uh, PC it goes into the CSR MEPC register. You want to show that in your uh, a simulation output too. So once this works, once you can prove this is working, you have a really super high probability, probability that the interrupts are working properly. So once again, uh, to, you know, know the thing to look at in this program is the, uh, the dump file. And what you have here is some um, some GC, I'll just say some GCC stuff you don't need to worry about. But this is where your program starts. You can actually see it step through this program. Uh, you can see where everything lives in this stuff. Um, the, the issue, the reason I, I include this is it's because uh, these, these are your PC values. These are the actual addresses. You should be able to see those come out in the PC. To prove that it's jumping to the ISR, you're going to see it. You're going to see it jump from like 3.0 or 4C to here, then 5C back up to here. And you want to, you want to show that explicitly in your, in your simulation, which means, of course, you're going to annotate it quite well. So once again, to make this work, what you're going to do is um, hit it with a reset and wait a while. Since you've got to wait a while, such that it finishes the initialization sequence. So there's a bunch of initialization code. If you hit the interrupt too soon, um, uh, it's just going to, it might work, but it's just, it's going to be hard to annotate. Uh, so you essentially what you want to do is kind of have the interrupts. Make sure there's no interrupt before you enable the interrupts. Keep in mind that the last thing that happens before you hit the before you exit the initialization sequence is that it was enabling the interrupt. So if you have an interrupt pending, once you enable interrupts, it'll go right into an interrupt cycle. So you don't want to do that. You want to uh, wait until all that initialization is done before you do anything. So you can generate the interrupt and you're going to see it's going to, you want to see it jump to the interrupt service routine and then you want to see it jump back. And in the process, you want to make sure it jumps that all the CSR registers are working properly. Everything is getting all the information it needs and when it needs to. Certainly in this program, you're going to see that it should be entering that interrupt state too. So the interrupt state is just one state, but you'll be able to explicitly see it in your code. I mean, I, I, I want you to show that code. And so that is that is it. Uh, that's a you know, second version of interrupts. By all means, if you have questions, be sure to ask me.